Well, welcome to the slightly delayed uh, spring 2014 uh, town meeting. We would have done this a couple of weeks ago, except we were visited by a blizzard. I'm not sure that the weather's changed much, except that it's not snowing at the moment. It's still just as cold. Um, this is an interesting uh, meeting today, lots of interesting things to talk about. So let me begin by just welcoming new members to the community. We have actually quite a few new members. I'm not going to take the time to individually identify them, but they include uh, faculty, uh, students, also uh, board members, staff, and President's Council members. So, so a lot of things are changing in terms of our community makeup, which is great. Uh, since we last met, we've had an admission cycle, which is, of course, still in process. Uh, this year, we set a new milestone for the school. We had 998 applications, which is terrific. We've been talking about trying to return to 1,000 applications for several years, and this year, our admission team essentially did it. 24% increase in one year. Um, now, if we just knew exactly why that happened, we'd be in great shape. But we're not going to, um, to worry. We're not going to look backwards. We're going forward, thinking that next year, 25% increase sounds like a right target to me. I don't know about you guys. Let's keep it going. Um, it's really the largest pool in seven years, the second largest pool in the college's history. Um, terrific group. And of course, one more Candidates Weekend uh, tomorrow. And everybody in the community plays a very important role. There's probably nothing more important that we're doing here than getting the right people to join us. Um, in addition to that, we had an expo in the fall. You know, the expo is, in a sense, Olin's recital at the end of every semester. Students pick something from their portfolio and perform for the community. Um, we had 157 presentations and 188 attendees, which is a really good group. Um, terrific things are going on. Career fairs. Um, there's an increasing number of companies, 114 companies have visited this year. It's a record number. If you drew the graph of this, it looks exponential. It just keeps getting bigger. I'd like to sort of point out, there's 114 companies that have been here so far. Um, we don't have 114 seniors, okay? There are not too many schools that have more companies visit than they have students, um, which is a great thing. And it's a great tribute to the work of our um, PGP office, which is doing terrific work. In addition, um, students are doing exceptional things. That's always been the case at Olin. And more recently, they've been involved in these entrepreneurial ventures, which are turning heads. You may have been reading in the press recently about each of these teams, particularly the technical machine group that raised a million dollars um, in a very short order. Um, and the other ones as well, the Mushi Meter is just taking off, lily pad scales, uh, lots of cool ideas. Um, students are the engine, the wind under our wings that create this school and that make it move forward and they bring people and ideas to uh, fruition all the time. Uh, it's really working well. We've gotten some good press recently. There's an organization called Boston Bostino. Um, this is about innovation in the Boston community, 1,000 people in, a com in a, uh, an award ceremony, and Olin was picked as the, one of the most notable game changers, visionaries, and industry leaders in higher education. In fact, it was the only entire college or uh, academic institution to be recognized in this way. Uh, so Olin continues to punch above its weight class and to get attention in, uh, in the media. Very interesting things going on with our robotics teams. Uh, we've always had uh, a robotics group which surprises people for what it's able to do. Um, this, this latest um, effort, I think, is really significant. Um, Intel is interested in creating a platform for robotics development so that people uh, all throughout the economy uh, will have the ability, sort of like a Lego set, to learn how to develop robotics um, uh, technology. This device that you see, Jimmy, is being developed at Olin. So Intel approached Olin, there's, an, there's a partnership going on, and this thing is being developed right here in our lab. And I think our, our robotics folks, um, Dave and Drew, de deter deserve a great deal of credit for getting this started. And that's not the only thing that's going on, they're also leading um, a robotics competition in sailing. 
Uh, MIT and Olin are partnering once again for an international competition. This one is going to be in Singapore next fall. So if you're wandering around in the robotics lab and you see this giant boat up there, uh, that's what it's doing there. Now, academic affairs. There's some really cool stuff going on in the faculty. There's always cool stuff going on in the faculty, but these things are so coordinated and so well aligned with the college's mission that I can't help but be very excited. Uh, three major initiatives. And the first one has to do with faculty recruitment. You know, when we have students in here on the weekend and we're talking to the parents about Olin's mission and about the education that Olin provides, we're always trying to point out that Olin's primary mission is to prepare people for life and our secondary mission is to prepare them for a career. And we're doing the same thing, in my view, in our faculty recruiting. Our primary mission is to select the right people uh, the right community, the right ideas, the right values, and the secondary um, uh, purpose is to find technical specialties that fit a certain niche in the curriculum, rather than doing it the other way around. And this has really got a tremendous amount of potential for building our um, faculty in ways that are very well aligned with the special community that Olin provides. So this is a potential game changer. In addition to that, uh, look at the cool ads. So these are, if you thumb through advertisements for academic appointments, they don't look like this, okay? Usually they say, uh, you know, beginning assistant professor, mechanical engineering at Penn State University, specialty of fluid mechanics with, you know, some subspecialty of something else. And that's it. Um, these things don't even mention that. Uh, they're going to attract a different group of people. In addition to that, uh, curriculum development. There's a lot of very interesting things going on in the curriculum. Um, you know, Lawrence and his group came up with this really cool idea that all incoming students will get a toolbox. Where else would you get a toolbox as an incoming student to an engineering school? That's both symbolic and real. Uh, tells you that as you go through the curriculum, you're going to build the capability to do more and more things. And, and engineering is about building things, and it's about uh, bringing things to life. Every good engineer should have a toolbox, right? And when they walk in the door, Olin, that's what they get. Uh, in addition to this, we're rethinking what fabrication means, reinvigorating the entrepreneurship program. Entrepreneurship is a very important part of what Olin does. Thinking about entrepreneurship in the right way has always been a bit of a challenge. Um, it has, entrepreneurship conjures up the idea of starting a small business in a garage. But entrepreneurship is much bigger than that. It's a way of thinking. It's a way of looking at the world. It's about taking initiative. It's about seeing opportunities and not challenges. Uh, it changes the way you behave. Sort of a religion, if you think about our folks next door at Babson. Um, and getting that deeply embedded into the curriculum uh, has been uh, sort of a, a major issue for Olin from the beginning. We have some great ideas and we think it's working well. I just showed you the slides of the students who are doing entrepreneurial things, so it's working. But getting this folded into the curriculum is something that takes a great deal of thought and it's not the same as what happens in a business school. Another interesting thing, Olin always is a, has talked about everything at Olin is supposed to be about innovation. Uh, everything at Olin has an expiration date. Uh, that's a, that's an ideal, that's a concept, that's a touchstone that we use when we think about not becoming too resistant to change. Um, our faculty are working on ways to make this very concrete and very real by developing a process in the academic program that continually has a large-scale experiment underway. It makes it possible for students to take advantage of this without disadvantaging them in getting their, their degree. Uh, and at the same time, allows faculty members to come up with really cool ideas for doing things in new ways, constantly. Not just once, not every 10 years, constantly. It's a very, it's a potential game changer as well. Uh, really cool stuff is happening. I just, I'm so excited telling the board about this um, that I know that five years from now, Olin will be a different place because of the alignment of academic um, personnel, academic processes here, and also the ideas that are coming out. Okay, the collaboratory. The collaboratory is our outreach arm. This is how we influence other institutions. And as you can see, the influence continues to grow. That bar graph that you see 
is just the delta. It's the number of visits that's happened since the last meeting that we were here. Um, and you can see in a year ago, we had had 42 visits since the last um, um, town meeting. This year, we've had 72 visits, almost double. Uh, so this is really an increasing footprint. In fact, uh, strategizing how we use that influence is really a very important part of making an impact in the rest of the world. And here's a you know, small sample of the 72 different visits that we um, hosted. You can see the kinds of institutions that have been here. Uh, for example, Kyoto University in Japan, which is um, one of their premier research universities, is quite interested in finding a way to collaborate with Olin. Uh, financial report. So how are we doing financially? Well, those of you who've been coming to this meeting um, in the past know about this graph. Engineers are all about graphs, right? Um, this blue line is the value of our endowment uh, as it's measured monthly. And the red line is the 12 quarter trailing average at that same point in time, three years going backwards. It has a lot to do with what we can spend in our budget. The red line determines the, the majority of our ability to spend in order to keep the school running. The cool news is the blue line is above the red line, okay? We've been trying to make that happen for a long time and it's starting to look like it might be heading in the right direction. And if the blue line continues that way, the red line will go up and you know, we'll have blue skies for a long time. Um, good news. Um, development, family, and alumni relations, and marketing. So our external community, our parents and alumni, have been extraordinarily supportive of Olin. This has been one of our strongest points since the beginning. As you'll see on the right, the participation rate, which is the percentage of people in that group who every year take the initiative to write some kind of a check to support Olin, is much higher than the average. In fact, the alumni participation rate at 71% is the highest alumni participation rate we've been able to find among any undergraduate institution in the country. There are some in the 60s, but we haven't been able to find one in the 70s. And the parent participation rate of 53%, although we don't have the same kind of comparative data for the highest in the country, is way above the national average. And even the size of the gift that people are giving is significantly higher than the national average as well. So um, we are very grateful for that support. When we go out and try to ask other institutions to support us, one of the first questions they ask is for this data. Because if your own community doesn't believe in you, why should they believe in you? And this sort of investment helps to open doors for us. It's just terrific. Everyone here who was here in the fall knows that, that our Vice President for Development, uh, Tom Crimmel, retired on December 31. So that's happened since the last time we met. And we've been very active for several months now in trying to find his successor. And the search committee has essentially completed its work for the, for the uh, winter and has forwarded the names of two people and we're in the process of trying to recruit one of those as we speak. So I'm very hopeful that by the time we have commencement, we'll have a new vice president in place. That's our goal. Um, Olin's front door, our website, is the way many, many people find out about us. And there's been a great deal of effort underway recently to change that front door. And very soon, within um, uh, weeks, we're going to hit the send button and a new front door is going to be launched. And a lot of people in our community have been involved in this and I'm very excited personally about the appearance of this new front door. The, the visuals are stunning, the, the graphics are spectacular, uh, the way we use the real estate on the uh, web is much better. And I'm absolutely certain that those of us in the Olin community, if we work at it, we'll be able to find things that could be improved, okay? That's what we do at Olin, particularly links that should be in one place or another. Those are not the headlines. The big things are, look at the impression that it, it provides right out of the starting gate. And I, so I'm very excited about this. I think this is gonna be a big improvement to Olin. 
We've also had quite a bit of publicity. Olin gets quite a lot of press, as it is. Um, I, I can remember not long ago meeting with presidents of some other universities, particularly engineering schools, who wanted to know the name of our consulting firm that we use to make sure that Olin gets on the front page of these newspapers. And we said, what consulting firm? We have like three people. Um, and that's our, our own you know, publications group. And they do a tremendous job. Uh, so Olin has gotten a great deal of attention, particularly this article in the Chronicle about the tiny engineering college that shakes up teaching has brought a lot of people to our doorstep. Um, the WGBH um, folks are really quite interested in us. There's a lot of things going on. Harvard Business Review is, is very interested in Olin as well. Uh, so stay tuned. The new newsletters, too. We've had a complete change in the format for these newsletters, the Ovations uh, newsletters that now O-Link that goes to alumni and to parents, too, customized for each one. More focused. Um, we're hearing lots of good things about the response. Finally, and this is my last slide so that I have plenty of time to take questions, I uh, just thought I would remind you a bit about Olin's mission and strategy. Uh, we have essentially three embedded uh, domains here that we work on. The, the core, the center, the heart of Olin is to attract the best and produce the exceptional. It's about people. Um, there's no more important thing at Olin than our people, and that's the last thing that we will ever abandon. Is the, is the commitment to the core uh, community that we have. After we have those people, um, the next thing that we do is put them to work in our laboratory to lead through innovation. And this excellent innovation that's working now, particularly the work that's going on in the faculty to develop um, uh, processes that will continuously experiment with major ideas and with new changes to the core of Olin's academic program uh, has the potential to be a game changer there. So the inside of Olin 10 years from now won't look like it does today in terms of the academic program. That's one of the hallmarks of Olin. The last outer circle there is our obligation to become an important and constant contributor to the advancement of engineering education in America and throughout the world. And that's this collaboratory effort which continues to grow and I believe it continues to engage a larger percentage of our faculty and staff and students as well, all in a positive way. Um, so that is basically what we're trying to do, and I'm delighted with the progress that we're making. I think we're the only institution that I've ever heard of that has a, a direct mission to work to change education in other institutions. And we, of course, do this not by taking Olin's courses and wrapping them in some plastic and selling them in a bookstore. That doesn't um, work at all. It's about the culture. And changing culture is not something that's easy to do. Um, it requires personal transformation and a total immersion experience. And that's why the collaboratory exists, and that's why it takes people coming to our campus and experiencing students and faculty in, in the flesh in order to understand what's happening at Olin. Okay, um, that's what I have to tell you about, you know, from the 100,000 feet, that's what's happening at the school, and I'm here now to answer questions, if anybody's still awake. Yes, sir. Good question. So the question was, notice that companies like DuPont and Dassault Systems happen to be visiting Olin as well. And he's sort of curious why they're here. Are they involved in educational reform or what's happening? And in both cases, uh, these are companies where the top management of the company has heard about Olin and has been very excited about our mission. But they didn't have much of an opportunity in the past to explore it. Um, and so we managed through some um, good fortune to persuade the president and CEO of DuPont to come and visit Olin and spend essentially a day here. And she came up and had a wonderful time uh, visiting us, and I think we've gotten on to their radar. Now, that's kind of interesting, because DuPont, as you know, is mostly a chemical company. Olin doesn't have chemical engineering. She was still very excited about what we see. 
And in Dassault Systems, so essentially the, the senior vice president that's responsible for the US operations uh, has been very excited about education reform. He's in, in fact, Dassault Systems has been in, uh, a strong supporter in ASEE of education reform at many institutions. And he happens to uh, be located not that far from Boston. So he's quite excited about Olin, and I'm sure you'll see more of them. And both companies are now on the radar for our PGP operations for internships and, and uh, placement too. Okay, other questions? Boy, what a mild group. I think it makes a difference. There are, there are more faculty here today than I've seen in a long time. I'm not exactly sure why. Did you give them a raise or something if they come in? Uh, it's been terrific, and there are fewer students. So uh, I think we get most of the interesting questions from students, and there's a smaller percentage, so maybe that's why it's tamer today. Yes, sir? Yeah. Very important question. How do we make sure that the outer circle, the outreach to the rest of the world, uh, is something that we only do after we have done a great job of taking care of the inner circles? So how do we keep from being overcommitted? Um, and that's a, an ongoing conversation. That's something that probably half of my time is spent worrying about every week. Um, and the, the basic answer to that is that we're very, very cautious and slow about making commitments that take time. Um, you know, I can tell you a little bit about our strategy in dealing with all this traffic that we've had um, defensively uh, in the last few years. We, we know that this is a good thing, but you can die from too much of a good thing, too. So um, what we do is that we basically have a strategy that when people hear about us for the first time and they've never been here, and on their own nickel, they show up in Boston and they say, can we visit? We rarely say no. Sure, you can come, but we'll structure a, sort of a, an economical way to deal with it, all right? Um, depending on who comes, I mean, they'll get a, hopefully, a student-led tour of the campus, and they'll meet with somebody on the leadership team. And I personally will try to spend an hour with people when they come, first time. Look, if they want to come back again, second time, now we sort of herd them into the Summer Institute, which happens in June. After classes are over, um, there is a minimal charge for that. Uh, we've had, I think, about 1,000 people go through this over the last four or five years. It's quite a, I mean, uh, we've touched 1,000 um, faculty members through that. I may be wrong about the number, but it feels about right. At any rate, uh, a lot of people come, 50 to 75 per summer institute. And the, and the growth rate in that is quite high. So that doesn't intrude on courses, OK? Um, and then, of course, if they want, and a very small number of them want to do more than that. So they may want uh, a workshop on their campus, or they may want some other special consulting activity on their location. And depending on faculty interest, if some faculty member raises their hand and says, I'd like to do that, I'd like to go to that place, I'd like to spend a week during spring break or during the holidays, um, and they are willing to pay for this, then uh, all expenses for travel and some compensation is involved, and we send a team there, two or three people. Um, and in a, only one case at this point have we made a multi-year commitment to an institution in Brazil uh, to help them think through the process of creating an entirely new school. Um, we have, I, I can name, I think, seven universities that would like to do something quite large with us right now that we're all just holding off. Um, we, don't, we have concerns about resources. We have concerns about the availability of faculty interests. Um, we're going to do this at the pace that is driven by our internal community's appetite to make that happen. But in no case will interactions with other institutions have a higher priority than providing the quality uh, education that Olin uh, has been known for from the beginning. That's our core. In fact, we believe that these interactions, if they're carefully chosen, improve the quality of the education that we provide here on campus. And our hope for the, the planning for making this work is that in the next five years, uh, we hope to grow our faculty by 25% without growing our enrollment at all. 
Okay, so there'll be more faculty resources, so that extra 25% will be available for spending some fraction of their time uh, doing these kinds of outreach activities without intruding at all on the coursework. And it has a an, an secondary benefit that it increases the range of topics that are available from the faculty to teach so that Olin's catalog or menu of opportunities increases as a result of this interaction. Okay, other comments or questions? Yes? That's a really good question. I think I'm going to ask uh, Jessica if she'd be willing to respond. She's really been more centrally involved. That might be a good thing. So, so the question was, while we're getting the microphone, um, can you tell us more about what this change in process that involves a continuous ability to innovate in the curriculum is about? How does that work? Uh, so great question. Um, the process really involves a kind of a different way of thinking. Um, I think over the last 10 years, we've tried to um, you know, think about the curriculum has an expiration date. So what does that actually mean? Do we stop doing everything and start doing a whole new set of things? Um, and actually, it's, it's actually a really interesting point that our collaborations with some of the partners that we've had, UTEP and INSPIR, um, and running the Summer Institute has really driven us to clarify sort of approaches and our thinking in that space and has really sort of fed back into us thinking about how we innovate in our curriculum. Um, and so the process that we've kicked off and that we're just starting to pilot really has to do with uh, trying to innovate in the spaces in the curriculum that every student experiences. The things that, you know, what does it mean to be an engineer at Olin? What are the kinds of experiences we want to provide for students? And so that's what we call the core. That gets us really thinking about what does your first year look like, your second year, the capstone. So the experiences uh, or the process is really about innovating in that space. It's about bringing groups of faculty together uh, to come up with the, the sort of ideas, the concepts, uh, a lot of integrated and interdisciplinary kind of experiences. And then how do we actually run those and try those out while we're running the curriculum we already have? And so our, you know, we're kind of exploring a couple of ways to do that, but, but one major way to do that is to kind of commit to one major experiment per year, make sure it still meets the kinds of outcomes and experiences we want our students to have, but actually try something new in those spaces. And then the other new piece of this is having a really clear, explicit point where we say, did this work? Should we continue doing this? Should we adopt this and make this a thing we do? Should we try a different experiment? Should we go back to, where, to this current state? And so that basically having a point built in where we do that has us really be clear about, you know, is this the experiment we wanted to run? Did it turn out well? Um, and, and has us then thinking, how can we add to this and do the next set of experiences? Uh, so we're, we're looking to, uh, to have a process that um, is continual, is not a, you know, pick a point in time, reinvent the curriculum, but that is really about continuous, but thoughtful and intentional um, reinvention. Good, thank you. More questions? Way in the back. So what does it mean if the endowment continues to recover? Is that basically um, what you're saying? Um, uh, if Steve is in the audience, he might be able to help us out. Um, you need a microphone, Steve? OK. Okay. More questions? Yes? So, to keep that thing off that, does that mean essentially that if the endowment is going back to the funding of initiatives, that it's not going back to the historic Well, we have a lot of work to do uh, in terms of our finances. 
um, if the endowment were to increase significantly so that we could um, not be so close to the line on, on uh, the future financial stability question, one of the first questions our board is going to ask us is, okay, so you know, we have enough oxygen to live through the day. What about the next 20 years? Um, are we putting away enough money, for example, to be sure that when the roof starts leaking, we'll be able to replace it. Olin actually at this point has, has not been budgeting uh, for the replacement of the roof on all of these buildings at the same time. This is called deferred maintenance. Um, you know, a, lot of other, a lot of schools are struggling with that. We've had the advantage at the beginning of having an all new campus. So we don't have to face it on a daily basis. But I can tell you we also have the disadvantage that all the buildings were built at once. So it's likely that they'll all need help at once, too. So we're facing this thing that's going to happen, whereas other institutions have that spread out over time, we don't. Um, so that's an issue. So our spending rate on the endowment is still too high to allow us to properly account for deferred maintenance that will happen in 20, 30 years down the road. So we need to begin to make progress on that. That's a competing demand. And the business about the uh, restoring the tuition scholarship to full, uh, to the same status that it was on the day that the school cre was started will require um, probably a large amount of money, not a small amount, and probably money that is restricted for that purpose. Uh, so we're really looking for donations in order to make that sort of thing happen. Uh, but it's not gonna be nickels and dimes to make it happen, that's, that's a lot of money that you know, like $150 million that we lost in three months. And that's the reason why that um, went away. If we had $150 million in the next three months that was aimed for that, we could probably get back to that thing right away. And beyond that, I can't answer exactly how that process would work. Okay, more questions? Boy, this is a remarkable meeting. I can't remember a meeting where we've had such docile audience before. This is like waving red meat in front of the lions. Yo, okay, question. Yeah, that's a really good question. So if I can try to paraphrase, it would be terrific if Olin had more flexible, innovative space for our to community to work in that sort of matched our way of teaching. And as you know, Olin has a physical plant which is beautiful. A lot of other campuses uh, are envious of the fact that we have new facilities and they're very attractive and they're well designed as a group. The only problem is they were designed before any of us were here. So they actually don't well address the mission of Olin, which would in involve studio spaces and more design and creativity. Just wasn't in the thinking when the architects put the buildings together. We also have a number of needs, needs that are unmet now that you actually, we can't see how to get there from here with the current physical plan. Um, as we look forward, uh, Olin always had this famous building B on the architectural footprint for the campus that we never actually got around to building. And it would be terrific if in the next N years, and I don't know what N is, Olin could develop the resources to build this last facility, one which would be designed to complement the facilities that we currently have now and meet these needs that are not easily met. Um, the, the plan to do that, though, would require finding um, donors who have a heart for that kind of change. I believe they're out there. And once we get this next vice president for development in place, and give us a year or two to get introduced to the right people, I'm optimistic that we'll be able to make progress on that. But I don't have a concrete date for it. We don't have a design for the building yet because it's a little premature. But it is a really important need. Yes? In the beginning, you mentioned that there were new faces on the President's Council. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so about the President's Council and the board, uh, how are they evolving and changing? Actually, the President's Council 
has played a variety of roles throughout the history of Olin, and it's moving in a different direction now. From the, in the very beginning, the President's Council provided a group of, uh, a pool of expertise in engineering, science, and in higher education, which helped advise the board at critical points in the development of the campus about what the right thing to do was. So in the, in the first person that we added to the President's Council was Bill Wolf, who was the president of the National Academy of Engineering. Then we added Paul Jennings, then provost at Caltech, Tom Magnani, then dean of engineering at MIT. We had the chief engineer at Raytheon. We had a, a whole group of people of that kind, including the former president of the University of Michigan. Um, now, as the institution has grown and morphed, the need for that kind of developmental uh, advice has changed. And now Olin is essentially emerging as a thought leader in the space of innovation in, in education. Um, and so we are actively thinking about uh, engineering the future of these President's Council meetings to position Olin in that way, so that we're the convener of conversations about uh, these new innovations. So some of the more recent additions to the President's Council have that um, footprint, okay? And I'm trying to think off the top of my head who I can mention. One of them is Eric Mazur. I don't know if you know Eric, but Eric is a, a well-known uh, physicist at Harvard who's been a leader in the flipped classroom movement. Another one is the fellow who was the keynote speaker at our October meeting, Jamil Salmi, who was the director of of tertiary education at the World Bank for 20 years, and is probably the foremost expert in what it means to be a world-class institution. Um, so these are people that we could call on to be keynote speakers at one of our meetings going forward. Um, the Board of Trustees is also changing, and it's growing. They, they have a commitment to uh, raise the bar and in influence. Um, we, we have, you know, they have a very unique role at the college. The uh, Board of Trustees has the fiduciary responsibility for the future of the institution. So they are legally responsible for the, the welfare of the people that are here and also the future of the financial resources necessary to sustain the school, not just the people who are here today, but the people who 20, 50, 100 years from now will be here as well. So there is some financial expertise on the board. There are leadership expertise. We just added a new person um, this last um, meeting. Actually, maybe it was in the October meeting. Uh, George Milne, who was the um, president of Pfizer Research and Development, I believe. Um, we've added um, at this meeting only a couple weeks ago, um, Beverly Weiss, who is a senior vice president at Boeing and who happens also to be an Olin parent. Uh, and there are a number of others that are in the, in the pipeline in order to, uh, to grow the size of our board. It, it will probably never be larger than 25, um, but we're at a barely sustainable size right now of 16. Turns out that the workload goes up as the number of people goes down. So it's just like having to teach a certain number of courses. If you only have one faculty member and he has to teach all those courses, the workload is high. Okay, any other questions? Way in the back? Okay, yes. I'm curious about the relationship between Olin and Brandeis and where that's going and what yeah. that is. When I first came here 10 years ago, we talked about all four schools in equal um, relationship and students could get vouchers to take the taxi to Brandeis. And just, I'm wondering where you see that relationship. It's a very good question. So the, the question paraphrased is, so what is the relationship in the future of the relationship between Olin and Brandeis? Well, nothing officially has changed in that relationship. It's still um, possible for Olin students to cross enroll at Brandeis and Brandeis students to cross enroll here. And some students do. It's just that the number of students is quite low. And as we all know, it, it, the, the uh, Distance between the campuses and the you know, existence of Route 128 between them doesn't help in any way. But um, we haven't had the same kind of, of high-level um, conversations that are, have been going on between Brandeis' leadership and Olin as we have between um, Babson and Wellesley and Olin. Um, and so that's been a bit of an, uh, a, a detour. One of the uh, obvious changes that's happened is that Babson, I mean, what Brandeis has had a change in leadership of the institution as a whole. 
Um, when Yehuda Reinhardt was there, uh, we had a lot of conversations. In fact, um, President Reinhardt was the first person to call me when uh, I arrived at Olin to start a school. This is before we had any facilities, um, and to begin a conversation. He was quite enthusiastic. But then there were a lot of changes within Brandeis. I think they had new provosts every couple of years, and we would just get to know one of them and uh, have you know, introductory meetings, and then there would be another one, and we'd start over again. So a lot of delays. And now they have a new president, um, Fred Lawrence, I think is his name, who has sort of a different vision for the direction of Brandeis. And um, so we are still um, interested and in still having conversations. They're just not going as quickly. Yes. Yeah, that's a good question. So the basic question is, is Olin giving any thought at all to the possibility of increasing the size of the student body as we go forward? And the question is, everything is on the table. We've considered this actually quite a lot in the past. There's a long history to deciding what the right size for the student body should be at Olin. The original vision of the Olin Foundation before any of us was here is that Olin would have about 650 students. That's what the architects were told when they began to design the campus. And so the original footprint for the architectural design includes this building B, it, which is an academic building. It has large shop space and other things. But it also had more residence halls. Um, along the way, we discovered that um, to finance an institution with 650 students with the kind of of high touch, um, high quality education that Olin is providing, uh, rather than one which has, for example, a twice the student faculty ratio, uh, is quite expensive. And it's actually not in the, it's not possible with the size of the endowment that Olin began. That's one of the key decisions that was made with the help of the President's Council early on. Should we stop what we're doing, which was very innovative and experimental and expensive? and instead drive the program to be able to have 650 students with a much more conventional educational approach, or should we continue with this more uh, innovative approach, which just doesn't scale up as well? And the board concluded at that point we would be better off, at least for the foreseeable future, if we had about 350 students at, with this quality of education rather than going the other route. And that was, you know, six years ago, something like that. I can't remember the exact date. Um, now, as we look forward in the financial crisis in 2008, we were trying to find ways to make the numbers work. And obviously, uh, the issue of, well, why don't we um, increase the student body came up. But the problem is, that doesn't help. Um, Olin is not a tuition-driven institution. In fact, we lose money with every student that we bring in. Um, so, I mean, you know, there's a sticker price out there which looks outrageous, right? Um, and nobody at Olin pays a sticker price because we pay half of the tuition for every student that's here. Um, but even if, they, even if we didn't pay half the tuition, even if you, you charged full tuition, Olin is still spending about eighty to $90,000 per student. I think that's the right number, isn't it, Steve? Somewhere in that range? Ninety to one hundred thousand dollars per student. So if you charged sixty and you're spending ninety to one hundred, we're losing thirty to forty thousand dollars on every student uh, that we bring in every year. So the question: If we're going to double the student body from three hundred to six hundred, how are you going to pay for it? And so it doesn't make sense financially to do that. Um, our current vision is to keep the student body at three hundred and fifty, and um, it's because it's not you know in on the plains in um, you know, at the South Pole, we, we are in a community of schools. There are other institutions around. The 350 students are not physically isolated from students in other campuses. Um, and so we don't feel a great deal of pressure at this point in time that there is a burning need for social reasons to expand the size of the community to become sustainable. Um, on the other hand, there is some advantage to having a, a, a size that we have 
because when we're going to completely re-engineer the uh, educational model, for example, like the change in the mathematics program to linearity one and two, it's much easier to do with a community and a campus size of about 350 than it would be with a campus of 3,000. It would take longer, it would be much more logistical challenge to make the kinds of innovative changes in the learning model. So Olin is a laboratory, and is, as such, having a, a fixed size is in fact an advantage. Does that help? Um, we've been actually more concerned about the sustainability of the size of the faculty. Um, from the beginning, we had expected that a faculty size of 50 to 60 was sort of the critical mass that you needed in order to develop a community of scholars that would make life feel um, secure. Um, and we've not been able to get there uh, from the beginning. And that's one of the things that we hope that we'll be able to do with this vision of growing our influence on other institutions so that the revenue is coming from that source rather than from tuition. Okay, yes? Yeah, that's a really good question. So how do you, how do you prioritize um, the possibility of, suppose somebody gave you uh, $100 million, okay? What would you spend it for? Uh, would it be a, a new building so that we have more innovative space? Would it be to make a down payment on increasing the, the percentage of the tuition that Olin pays for every student that comes in? Would it be growing the faculty so that we have this larger community? How do you make those decisions? And the answer is we don't have an algorithm for doing that. We have a process for doing that. And it involves a great deal of introspection and, and, and discussion uh, among the faculty, among the board of trustees, and among the community. So if we make a big decision like that, you won't read about it in the newspaper. You'll hear about it on campus through a lot of conversations from us first. Yes? So the, so the question is, has Olin had any um, interaction and serious conversations about collaboration with the Wentworth Institute of Technology in uh, Boston? And the, I think the short answer is no. I don't know of any uh, conversations like that. We've, we've had a few um, uh, individual uh, discussions with people from there, but nothing that has reached my desk. You've, you heard of anything, Vin? Okay. Uh, recently, uh, Aaron Hoover actually uh, went on a field trip uh, to Wentworth, actually to sort of explore at least uh, a part of that space, especially in the fabrication uh, area. Other than that, I had a scoping conversation with their with with their provost, and I didn't see anything right off the bat as far as at the institutional level, but I think. There, you know, there may be a chance at, at some of the operational levels, and that that all happened in the last few months. Any more questions? Yes. So, um, as the college becomes more well known, the types of students it's going to attract are going to change. Have there been any looks at uh, looking at how the culture of the student body may have been changing over the years, and how does that affect the way that the students may be of the collaboratory effort? <laughs> Yeah, it's a really good question. Um, so there's actually several things packed in there. Uh, one of them is, as Olin becomes more well known in the future, uh, it hopefully, and we're seeing a little bit of evidence this year, it might attract more applicants. It might attract even a different kind of applicant, a sort of applicant who doesn't view Olin as quite the same risk that it appeared in the early days when Olin wasn't even accredited yet. And is that going to possibly lead us in a direction where the culture uh, changes as the student interests and the student uh, attitudes and behaviors change going forward? And secondly, is there any way that we can monitor that? And is anybody paying attention, um, so to speak? Is that roughly? Yeah. 
So this is a conversation that I have, I think, in my house with students at small groups for dinner probably 20 times a year, okay? Uh, every student group since the first partners felt that the next student group couldn't possibly be as risk tolerant and as aggressive as they were. And, um, you, you know, so we've been paying attention. I, don't, I can't say that we have, a, you know, a yardstick that is well uh, established that everybody understands, but uh, I don't think any topic that I can think of um, has gotten more attention and more constant concern than this one. Losing the culture at Olin, um, the, the, particularly the culture of student innovation and creativity, uh, would be uh, a huge mistake. Nobody here, I think, has an appetite for that kind of a change. I think probably the best insurance we have uh, is, number one, bringing this up so that everybody knows that it's a concern, that it's serious, that we all want to prevent it, so that every one of you is deputized to keep your eyes out for it. And secondly, our candidates weekend, when we're, we do our best to try to identify people who share the same values and the same mission that Olin does as we bring in. Um, are there differences in students? Um, I can't, can't see that, um, that sort of difference. Anything that you, that you look at that's a metric, uh, even things like the um, NISI scores, the, the National Survey of Student Engagement, which is a sort of a deep dive of attitudes and behaviors of students, there aren't red lights showing up um, in terms of big changes. And I can tell you, um, I remember having an uh, alumni reception in the Bay Area um, a year or so ago, maybe 25 uh, Olin alumni. Now, you know, our oldest alumni are only about 30, so this is not um, you know, a wide range of uh, ages. On the other hand, I know that the students in the first couple of classes told me after that alumni reunion that they were greatly relieved because they thought they were the only ones who dealt with risk and change and were really um, uh, interested in creative, innovative activities. But when they met the graduates who were really quite recent and were involved in, um, in uh, similar kinds of startup companies in the Bay Area, uh, they concluded that these students really have a very good uh, dose of the Olin disease. They have the same kind of um, entrepreneurial thinking and the same kind of attitudes and behaviors. So something at Olin apparently is still working, even though the courses look quite different now and there's a different group of faculty here. Uh, so we're hopeful, let's say, that the culture at Olin, um, which is our most prized possession, will not change in spite of the other kinds of changes that we have going forward. Anybody else want to add to that? Because there's a lot of folks here who are close to this issue. I'm not seeing hands go up, plus we're also getting close to noon. One more question. Oh. So I have a question. Oh, I didn't realize you were asking a question. I thought you were. I have a question from online. Um, okay. Matt Collier would like to know, how do we plan to pay for the 25% increase in faculty? Yeah, it's a really good question. How are we going to pay for this growth of faculty? And, you know, through a combination of things. And the idea is, first off, through uh, uh, support from private philanthropy, from individuals who care about Olin's mission, who want to change education in America and throughout the world. There are a number of foundations that have been very helpful. For example, we got a um, $1.4 million gift from the Argosy Foundation recently to support faculty exchange and help the collaboration work. I think there are other foundations who have a similar interest. In addition to that, um, some of the interactions with, with uh, international partners uh, bring funds with them. And uh, we believe that some of these uh, opportunities will come with funding sources that will be substantially in excess of the direct costs necessary to provide the the service and that excess, when it's used properly, can generate uh, resources. W one way of thinking about this, um, you know, which is, of course, at this point still speculative, you all know how the um, scope program works, where there are companies that come and the companies um, are interested in supporting student projects and the companies are asked to contribute $50,000 per project. And we have now about 15 projects 
And when you look at that, that resource, if it's reliable, if you can depend on it, if it happens year after year after year, that income stream allows the college to have enough confidence that we can invest in more faculty and staff in order to run the program that way. It's what I call earned income. And that kind of earned income might also develop from our external interactions through the collaboratory. Okay, so it's a combination of things. And with that, I think it's noon. Maybe we should uh, end this. You've been uh, the most polite audience I think I've ever had in one of these uh, town meetings. I want to thank you very much and hope you have a terrific spring semester. Thank you. Thank you.